Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Self Made Podcast presented by Rocket Mortgage. And today is a very, very exciting day because we have our first guest who is not directly related to me or the 100 Thieves brand. <laughs> this is fantastic. And what a way to kick that off because we have brought on Daryl Morey, the general manager for the Houston Rockets, the 2000 NBA, the 2018 NBA Executive of the Year, a lot of other accolades, and I'm sure history in your career itself, which we're definitely going to jump into. But I'm here joined by my co-host Jackson. Excited to be this here. This is obviously presented by Rocket Mortgage. But Daryl, thank you so much for joining us here in LA. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Listen, everybody, I'm sure if you're watching the YouTube video, the change of scenery is probably a little jarring, but uh, we are now on our first mobile podcast. We left the Cash App Content House, and we're on the road here downtown in LA. And so if I would recommend it, I'd probably make this an audio-only podcast. Daryl Moore can carry the load. With He's, he's a good-looking guy. I think guy, he will. I think he but will. But the aesthetic of the set like itself. Only because well, of the beard. Yeah, yeah the beard's the strong. Beard. Yeah, actually, last time I saw you, you didn't have a beard. No, no. I figure it works for James Harden, so it's good for everybody. So. <laughs> Wait, can we can we flash the shirt as well? Yeah, that's, that's a great shirt. The beard. <laughs> Okay, so listen, I just want to do some quick reminders, and we're going to do this. We're going to talk about Rock Mortgage here quickly. Um, this podcast can be found everywhere the podcasts are uploaded, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts. And uh, I want to make sure that you guys do know that if you leave a five-star review, there is a very good chance you will be read. Well, actually, the chances are slim to none. But I am <laughs> going to read a five-star review really quickly. I didn't pick this once. I, like I always say, Alex picks this. So uh, this one comes from a uh, username gold i'm fresh out of college and i'm new to the gaming industry so i love popping this podcast on at work and just feeling inspired but my put my nose to the grindstone and get it done there's nothing better or more inspiring wow gold five stars we just picked basically reviews that gas us up exactly so. yeah well we don't pick them that's the thing yeah our producer does alex takes care of it alex do we have a, a rock and mortgage ad read today all right this is my favorite part wait jackson you do the ad read right, you probably read it. better than me now here's the thing Make sure you look up at the camera every now and again so yeah, it looks thanks. like you're competent. You're a competent yeah, reader. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Don't right. dig yourself straight into the paper. Perfect. It's a mistake a lot of rookies make. Go ahead. So we do want to take a moment to thank Rocket Mortgage. They've been with us really since the very beginning of 100 Thieves. Um, and they're the presenting sponsor of Selfmade. We are so thankful for everything they've done from our League of Legends team across kind of all of the content we make. Uh, and they've really made this podcast happen. Um, they were really important kind of from the very beginning in the Rocket Mortgage uh, League of Legends house. And we think we have the best gaming house in uh, all of esports. And it was thanks to Rocket Mortgage. Their dedication to going that extra mile. What? You're going off script here and I kind of like it. Playing in my my space, I have to exist. Anyway. Alex, we gonna get yelled at for this, but it, it, I mean, it sounded good. I'm already it's more sweating. authentic. If it's yeah, exactly, yeah, know, exactly. Damn. All right, let me finish. Let me finish. Their dedication to going the extra mile has not only allowed us to elevate 100 thieves, but also works to make the home buying process super easy, smooth with their clients. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Push mut push button. Whoa, get choked it at the end. Push button. Get mortgage. All, All right, Rocket Mortgage. Right we absolutely love you. We needed that for our gaming house. Our gaming house was terrible. <laughs> you, <laughs> you we we made so it? many mistakes with clutch gaming. Should, that, should've I should have called up. you up. Yeah. yeah hey, yeah. we didn't we didn't really know what we were doing. Rocket Mortgage came through and uh, helped us out seriously. So. We just had a woman yelling at us for messing with her art and stuff. That was great. That's so. his Wait. house. <laughs> Wait, that's a serious topic of discussion at our house too, because the house that we lease from. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to get into that because she's a very sweet woman and the house <laughs> is fantastic, but she has art at the house that she had to take out because it was so expensive. Yeah. She signed a release for the house. She knew, We told her exactly what we were going to be doing. And then our first tour of the house had like 500,000 views and she calls me up freaking out like, listen, I can't believe you put that on camera, this, that, and the other. I'm like, oh no. Yeah, we 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 had some fun, some fun stuff. Just suffice to say, you should check out the house owner just as much as they check out the gaming, the gaming company. Absolutely. So now that's actually, I think, a, a great start to this because I'm sure that you've done media uh, often. Obviously, like that's probably a pretty big role as the GM of one of the most popular NBA teams in the entire league. But I think for me. I've asked a lot of questions to our guests about the beginning of their careers, and I'm sure you've talked about it in some way or another. 
But where I really like to start at the beginning of self-made interviews is really the beginning for you. Because mm -hmm. obviously we see you now as one of the most prevalent, popular GMs and like I said, all basketball. But where were the origins? Where did everything start for Daryl Morey? <laughs> right outside Cleveland, right where actually uh, Steph Curry and LeBron James were were born. Akron? Uh, yeah, right there. Medina, okay. Ohio, right near there. So... Uh, I was I was just a super nerd. I, the SIGGRAPH is here in LA right now. I don't know. That's the computer science biggest conference. So I was excited to happen to be there this week. Um, I was a programmer, big into data, uh, really studied baseball because that's all there was. I'm old, uh, much older than the people listening probably. So. Were you an Indians fan? I was. It's embarrassing when you go back and look at the logo now. But yeah, I was Indians, Browns, Cavs, all the all the teams. But Indians were. I played basketball, but the main sport I worked in was baseball because it was the only sport with data. So I was fascinated with using data, and that's mostly because I wanted to win. You know, like uh, Stratomatic baseball, all those games with my friends, essentially. So that's how I first got into baseball statistics was beating my friends in uh, in the tabletop games, baseball games. So, uh, including Earl Weaver baseball, which was one of the first uh, baseball programs uh, in the '80s. So that's how I got my start was doing that, and then went off to. I'm trying to do the least boring quick version of this went off to there's uh, no boring version <laughs> of, of of a man of your stature i think everybody i mean for me i'm a huge basketball fan and just talking to somebody like you in the position that you're in it, anything i think would be helpful so anything you want to talk about about your career or what led you to this point i think everybody would find very interesting well i, th I think well, the whole story of my career is basically being ready for the opportunity but then serendipity comes along because a lot of really talented people just don't get that chance they don't get put in the game they don't get the at bat and uh i've been lucky enough to be ready but also a lot of serendipity a lot of chances. The first one was at actually Northwestern where I went to undergrad. I was in a really terrible work study job that you have to do for financial aid. Uh, it was a professor in statistics, which I was excited about, but the professor just hated hated having me because he thought I was an idiot. Like I was a <laughs> freshman. He was like, this guy's useless. He gave me projects, but didn't care when I finished them. He like complete contempt for me. <laughs> so I was really depressed in my freshman year. You think he would still remember your name? Absolutely not. He had no idea. I don't even think he knew I worked for him. He was he was just he was he was basically an asshole. Just, you should go uh, shake his hand. Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, he's he was pretty old. He might be dead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you should definitely go shake his hand. Yeah. No, just, yeah. Yeah. Oh, exactly. So uh, I, I was depressed and I said, well, shit, there's got to be some jobs around here. And I looked I happened to read reading Bill James' uh, 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 handbook, um, the Bill James Abstract, which was like the foundational work for baseball statistics. And I was reading the back one night late at Northwestern, and it said that they're starting a company called Stats Inc. in a city called Skokie. And I was like, well, Skokie's probably got to be far from Northwestern. Turned out it was one. Skokie, one, Illinois? Skokie, Illinois. Yeah. Oh, you went to Northwestern, Illinois? Yes, exactly. Oh, Northwestern okay. University. I, I, yeah, I yeah, feel like I've heard so many Northwestern. I just don't know. Well, there's Northeastern, well. which is, you know, just the redheaded stuff. I grew up in Chicago. Uh, to North. Yeah, yeah. Um, you were Southwest, right? Southwest yeah, suburbs, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Near, isn't there some casino down there or something? I mean, there's a lot of, there's the yeah. boat in Elgin. And then there's like, I think Harris, which is like next to O'Hare, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. So, I haven't been to the boat. So I didn't know where Skokie was because it wasn't. I was not from Illinois, and but it turned out it was one town over. I went applied, got a job. I was like the tenth employee at Bill James's uh, new company. He was starting with John Dewan. Uh, for those who don't know Bill James, if you've seen the movie Moneyball, he's the guy who gave all the dia ideas to Billy Bean in the movie, basically to that was change the Oakland A's. Yeah, really helpful for me. Yeah, there is you go. It like the Jonah Hill character or somebody. No, this is the guy with the big beard who was in the uh, the the canning factory in Lawrence, uh, Kansas, uh, who wrote all the Bill James abstracts. So they're they're literally the foundational documents for all sports statistics. So and was this someone you knew and admired and had like learned? He was like my him? hero growing right. up, basically. Okay, cool. And he he didn't come to the office much because he was in Lawrence, Kansas. But when he came, it was a big deal. So that's how I got my start in uh, in sports. I worked there. I left Northwestern and then serendipity intervened again. I basically tried to get a job with any major sports team. None of them returned my calls, resumes, anything. So I decided that the only way to work in sports was going to have to make a lot of money. I was going to have to be super rich to buy a team, essentially. 
Uh, that plan also didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that was your approach, though. I'm just like, I guess I'll get rich enough to buy one. Well, because at the time, and it's still pretty true, although it's changing, like to get into sports, you have to like, you have to be the son of, you have to be like related to someone mm -hmm. or have your parents be involved in the industry. And that's how it was. And that's, that's I, at least that's what I tell myself why I couldn't get in. Is that, is that still true today, do you think? Even after everything we, like it's Moneyball changed, and you so, and... Now you got more uh, like investment bankers, VCs, people like that buying teams and they're running them way more professionally. And so uh, there's more room for folks with different backgrounds to be hired. But at the, in 1996, there was not uh, any room for that. Um, so that uh, that's so I went to go off and get rich, ended up at a consulting firm where you do not get rich. <laughs> you do pretty well, but you don't get rich. And then they happen to work uh, with the group. Uh, that was going to buy the Boston Celtics. And um, I worked on the team that helped that group, Wick Rousebeck, Steve Pelucco, buy the Celtics. And that's how that's how I got in. But if I wasn't randomly at that consulting firm, I might never have gotten a chance. So Hey, things happen for a reason. I actually don't believe that. I don't think everything no, th happens for I a don't reason. think things happen for a reason. I think I, everything's I, random, and then we ex post apply a, some pattern that makes us feel better. Right place at the right time. I think for me, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, Moneyball, I'll be honest with you, that is actually one of my favorite movies. And then I'm just going to be uh, honest again. You know, John Robinson, who's the president and CEO who you met, when he heard that Clutch Gaming was getting into the LCS, I think he fanboyed. I, he wants to be here so badly right now because he's oh, such a big fan of your career. Love to talk to him. And I just didn't know much about you um, because I mean I followed the NBA and I understood like what the Houston Rockets were doing, but I didn't really follow any of like the 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 the, the, the top offices and 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 the moves that they're making. And so when I heard that you have like coined or people have coined the term Mori Ball instead of Money Ball, I was like, wait, I understand this reference because I love Brad Pitt and that damn movie. <laughs> so, Jennifer Aniston? Not no, Jennifer Aniston is not in more Money Ball. <laughs> no, she's not. Come on, I would There's know if Jennifer Pitt, Aniston though. was in that movie. <laughs> now, really quickly, I do want to say, guys, it's a it's a damn hot box in here. Yeah, I'm sweating. Warm. I got a jacket. It's okay, Daryl, I'm so sorry. This is not I'm, what hundred thieves is about. I'm from Houston. This is true. Yeah, yeah, heat. This we're is not what Rocket Mortgage is about. We, Rocket have, we have fans, but they're too loud for the audio. It's okay. Rocket Whatever. Mortgage will sell you a house in any city, I bet. That's even, very true. Push button, yeah. get mortgage. We love it. So you end up at the, at the Boston Celtics. And in what capacity were you working with them? Because you obviously weren't the GM right off the rip. Right. Yeah. No, they brought me in a, as a basically a chief consultant, like the most benign role. But uh, I, I was working with ownership. And they gave me like literally, I was very fortunate, they gave me the jobs that were most important at the time. First, we had to do a reorganizations, which is a fancy word for you got to fire people and hire people, which is no fun, but really the first thing you do when you buy an organization generally. So I worked on that. Then I actually worked on ticket sales because there's a ton of like 10 million and extra ticket revenue just by optimizing that. I worked with Sully. If, you've, if you guys read Bill Simmons, the famous Sully in all his columns. Uh, worked with him uh, and his team to you know make more ticket money, and then quickly I worked with Danny Ainge. I don't know if you know Danny Ainge, but he's uh, um, he came in as the GM, and I worked with him in my early years there. How many people did you have to fire? Well, we ended up moving on from I'd probably say like ten to fifteen, and then oh, okay. added added uh, you know much more than that. So so coming into the Celtics, someone with your background, I assume. There was a level of, okay, I want to come in and do something different, even early on. Was there anything that was like shocking or uh, surprising when you first came in that was, wow, sports is a lot more traditional than my background or what I expected? Or was it pretty quickly, we're going to do things different. We're going to bring in data. We're going to bring in statistics. Well, the ownership, Wick and Steve, are both... Uh both like Hila, one's in private equity, one's venture capital, they were determined to do things differently. So I had a mission sort of given to me by them, which was, uh, you know, bring in new ideas. Um, so I, I would say, you know, there were certain things that were run like more traditional because of how the Celtics, they, they were the most successful franchise from the 50s, 60s, even into the early 70s. Uh, and because of that, usually when you have that much success, you tend to that success brings some of your, you know, sort of ossification of being stuck in how you do things. And I think that continued for many years until the new ownership 
the new ownership came in and uh, you know, just to give you an example on the ticket sales side that Sully Sully fixed, which was um, the courtside seats at the Boston Celtics. I believe in when we came in, were still ninety dollars, and at the even at that time, this Wait, was in say that again. Yeah, they were ninety dollars, and even at that time in two thousand two, when the team was bought, like all the comp cities were like over a thousand dollars, like the Knicks were over a thousand dollars, so. We just, I mean, it was just just basic math that there was a ton of opportunity. And you found out things like they did that because they had relationship with secondary sellers, which was sort of not great and yeah, things like I can't that. So it would be. Yeah. Wait, so how old were you when you started at the Celtics? I was uh, 30. Did 30, you have to yeah. deal with. I'm not like you. You really like have a whole company at 26 or something. Oh, it's gaming. It's different. I like <laughs> being 30 years old working at the Celtics. I, I would imagine it was pretty awesome. It was amazing. Yeah. Especially growing up dreaming of working in sports. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when you talk about it, it's like you obviously took, you had a, a, a huge interest in computer science, very data driven. But I mean, if your entire aspirational goal is to work in sports, to be 30 years old, I mean, did you get to go to every game or what was the experience yeah, like around game. the arena? I mean, it, it, I mean, it's an iconic franchise with an unbelievable fan base. So, I mean, it was, I st they made fun of me because in the first draft, there was a player pick, the 56 pick in the draft, which is a meaningless pick. They picked a guy off one of our data models, Brandon Hunter. Uh, who ended up going on to do pretty well, much better than the normal 56 pick. They used to make fun of me because whenever he'd come in the game, I would like get so hyped and excited. <laughs> and Danny Ainge, who was like an NBA champion, all these people would just totally make fun of me because I was worrying about this guy I picked at the end of the second round, which normally has like a one in a thousand chance of making it in the NBA. So that's pure passion though. Yeah, no, no. I was I was doing the whole Arsenio Hall, you know, screams and jumping up and down like a like a little kid. So. Like Steve Ballmer. Yeah. Yeah. Actually Ballmer's got me beat. I mean, I love that but people are cause I come from the computer side of things and I, I've you know, I don't know Ballmer, but I knew of his career for years and years and years. And I love that people are tickled by him because he's the same guy he was at Microsoft when I was, you know, slinging Microsoft in the 80s. So he's a very passionate guy. He seems like he's going to be an amazing owner. So. Did you guys see the uh, the uh, press conference with Kawhi and Paul George? <laughs> that's literally every sales conference of his. Like, <laughs> really? he does that every sales that, conference. See, that's yeah. the question that I had. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I want to go into a an executive meeting yeah. with Steve Ballmer while he was at Microsoft and Bill Gates and see how he operates. That 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 was every, every single meeting. Uh, he's famous for his sales meetings and he's famous for his passion. So... Uh, I have so many questions I want to ask you, but I you want to go really, in order. You really were kind of coming up in this transition from this legacy family owned MBA to what it is now. And not to say it's not all of that's gone, but it's much more of everyone from the business world coming in and saying, how do we, how do we change this and don't just do what's already been done? Yeah. When you buy a franchise for 2.2 billion, you're not going to, you, you need to run it professionally or you can't make the math work. Yeah. So that, it's the large valuations that have driven a lot of the change mm. uh, in the industry. So. Okay. So when did you finally make the jump over to the Houston Rockets? Because you-, you Yeah, how so many, I was how at the Celtics for four years and did a lot of work with uh, Danny Ainge and Mike Zarin, who's still there. Um, and I couldn't believe it. We It was in our worst season. We were the second worst team in the NBA, and the owner of the Houston Rockets had read Moneyball and like was looking for a change. And I actually was helping to send candidates for the GM job in Houston because I didn't think I was ready. I thought I was too young. I didn't think I was ready. Sent candidates for that job for like a year that he kept rejecting hmm. through like a headhunter basically. And then finally the headhunter was like, well, he's sick of like rejecting people. He wants to at least talk to you. And I was like, okay, I don't think I'm ready, but sure, I'll go talk to you. So I flew down in 2006, uh, I think it was March of 2006, and met with him at 9 a.m. and had the job like at 2 o'clock. What was so. it? How does that happen? What was the interview like? How did you show him your chops? Like what was convincing enough to be like, okay, five hours from now, you're going to be like the assistant GM of the Houston Rockets? Yeah, so I showed him a plan, a plan for the team, and obviously I, I said a lot of the right things. Um, he probably shouldn't have hired me and that that – you know, what I was showing him was, you know, probably wouldn't have even impressed me because I had to do it so quickly because the interview came together so fast. Uh, but by two o'clock, he's offered me the job and I, I don't even know what to do. 
He's like, well, who's your agent that I can negotiate with? I'm like, I don't have an agent. I don't have and so I call one of my friends and he's like, yeah, 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 just pretend you have an agent. So I pretended I have an agent. Then I'm calling my wife, who's a big sports fan. We, our honeymoon was at the Olympics. And I was like, he's offered me the job. I think I should take it before he changes his mind. <laughs> She's like, take it, take it. That seems like a good opportunity, like, which I still respect. <laughs> take it. Because <laughs> we had little kids at the time and she had to move. And uh, she was very supportive and she was just like, yeah, I mean, obviously the the job of a lifetime. So I got, yeah. You seem to have a lot of humility. I think that was the one thing that was astounding to me when you came to the LCS for the first time. We were just sitting there playing pop a shot. And I was, I was playing so poorly. Too. I was so mad. About yeah. You, you, I mean, to be honest with you, I ran up your pockets. Like, yeah. I, I, I no, if we were on the regular like, machine, I would have beat you. But like, well. I don't know. No, it wasn't. It wasn't working. So uh, I have my excuses ready. You yeah, I, I'm just saying, like maybe like a courtside seat to a Rockets game at, for for, hey, for losing. Come I to Houston, like, I'll I'll set you up. You're right, like a world class player and things. I I never was. So it's Listen, no shock that you beat no, me. No, no, no. You, you <laughs> too much. You're too much. <laughs> so a lot of humility, but I think uh, what an interesting position to be in because at that time you must have been like what 34. Uh, when I came to LCS, or no, 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 no. Oh, when I, oh, when I was first at the Rockets, yeah, I was 30, 34 when I, when I came to the Rockets. Yeah. And what was that transition like? So you go from the Boston Celtics, obviously a new owner with the Rockets. What was what was the difference? It's crazy because you go from like no one having any idea who you are to like a lot of people, especially in Houston, knowing. And you probably went through that uh, in your transition. And yeah, I think that's the biggest change: is going from not. Knowing, no one, no, no one knowing who you are to a lot of people knowing. That's 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 tough. It's tough on your family, things like that. So that's probably the biggest change. And who was playing for the Rockets in two thousand six? There was they, wait, that wasn't. We, still... we had maybe the biggest player in the world, Yao Ming. Yao Ming was yeah, still. In the, we're okay. still the number one team in the world because we're number one in China. So if you just count fans of Rockets, we're number one in the world. So. Huh. Whatever had had was it was it Steve Young? No, what's Steve it? Young's a quarterback on the Niners. No, 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 no. <laughs> Oh my God, it's gonna Steve kill. Francis. Steve Francis. Yes, oh yes. my God, dude, he was a legend on NBA Live. He was, yeah. He, and then he he went and played in China, right? He probably played in China at the end because he was struggling. Yeah, he was he was struggling and struggled with his career. Right when he should have been peaking, he like tailed off completely because of off the court stuff. So, what was the energy like at the organization? Because obviously, Yao Ming was just like a monumental, like, and cultural player for for the NBA. And what 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 did you see as an assistant GM, like helping out the organization? What was next, or were you guys like stuck right there in that mindset, like we have to win now? I was very fortunate in that the they had Yao Ming and Tracy McGrady, two all world players, and so my job was really filling in the gaps, which is something that, um, which is something that. <laughs> sorry, that's my phone. Well, that's all right, hey, man. This is it. This ain't. This isn't ESPN. You could do anything you need to do. I'm sure, and you got two phones. Why does every NBA player and executive have two phones? Tell you why the players. Have <laughs> oh, and I've heard stories. We don't need to go into that. Actually, yeah. we should talk about that. No. Yeah. Um, so when I first. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's step back a little bit. Let that's me. a that's a self made at night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's your extra, after hours extra after hours podcast. But um, yeah, did Yao Ming, Tracy McGrady, two all world players. I completely forgot about Tracy McGrady too. I don't think I'm a sports fan anymore. I can't believe this. <laughs> Tracy McGrady. Sorry, wow. hey, a lot of them went out. Like we had Dwight Howard later, who was a. He says was a good Call of Duty player, but I'm guessing you tell me no. Uh, a lot of these NBA players are not very good. <laughs> really, any athlete that says they're good at video games are are, are just terrible. Like what? Chad Ochocinco, I've called him out multiple times because he keeps tweeting out that he's the best Call of Duty player in the world or yeah. the best FIFA player in the world. There's a couple of them that are pretty good. I think Ben Simmons is pretty good. Ben Carl Simmons Towns is actually good. pretty good. And then Carl Towns, I'd imagine if he plays with Ben Simmons, is pretty they good. They play a lot, so I'd be surprised. But uh, I, I, my only example, I was a I was a top-ranked table tennis player, and Dwight Howard was challenging no me. I was way. Like, no let, way. I was like, let's go. So he comes over. I get out my paddle, and his, like, his, his turtle, his entourage, was like, holy shit, guys, he has his own paddle. You're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like 21 to 4. Oh, man. Out. Have so, you played Reggie Miller? Oh, mercy. I have not played Reggie Miller. I heard he's he want, pretty good. He wants to play me. I'd be. How did you get that good at table tennis? Just pick any nerd like stereotype. I fit it. You know, comic <laughs> books, table tennis, programming, That's all awesome. that kind of stuff. So. 
So just just pick that. But yeah, so the nice thing was analytics is very good at fi- finding role players around stars. Uh, so we first went out and got Shane Battier, who ended up becoming famous later because of Michael Lewis. Um, and so the nice thing was when I first got there with a good foundation, we were able to use data to fill in around Yao Ming and Tracy McGrady and uh, had a lot of success. And we're, I think at one point, almost the, I think we're tied with the Lakers to be the favorites to win in 09. And then both Yao Ming and Trish McGrady got hurt that year. So I have so many questions. I like, I have so many questions when it comes to your approach to recruiting players or drafting or anything that's related to the NBA. But then I also have so many questions about like fandom in the NBA. It's like, how good do you think Tracy McGrady would have been if he was never injured? Uh, he he actually is, I think, the best player I've ever seen at his peak just that I've, most that I've talented. worked with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He just he because he was six nine, six eight, six nine, could shoot, could pass, athletic, could defend. I mean, at his peak, I mean, he was. I, I and I've worked with Paul Pierce, James Harden, now Russell Westbrook, who I haven't seen. Uh, but I think Trace McGrady at his peak, you could argue for as being the best player I've worked with personally. Okay, now. Assistant GM, you end up the actual GM. How long did that take while you were there? So they basically hired me with the plan to make me the GM in the next year. Um, and I didn't screw Did you up. know that? Yeah, they told okay. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have come without it because I was on a good path at the Got Celtics. It. So, um, so they, yeah, they hired me as the GM one year later. So they, they followed through. Everyone said they were going to like renege on it, but they didn't. So now was there anybody at the Rockets organization that thought that your mindset or your approach to the game was like too progressive or too different? Because I mean, that in the, in the movie Moneyball, there's all the old scouts look at Brad Pitt, like he's an idiot and they get into arguments and start fighting. Was Did you have to deal with any of that friction? Not not as much because the people at the Rockets, it was a very well-run organization when, when I came. We're very forward thinking. Many folks who are there have gone on to work at, at other uh Dennis Lindsay is now running the Utah Jazz. Sam Hinkie went on to run the 76ers, Gerson Rosas running the Timberwolves. And they all come from the Rockets organization? Yeah, so they're all all with the Rockets organization. So we were pretty forward-thinking. Rudy Tomjanovich, who won two titles in the 90s, he was a very forward-thinking guy. So I was very lucky to come in uh, and work with very good people and hopefully take them in the right direction as well. So Yeah, and I guess the NBA is probably a little different than baseball because there's so many positions that you need to fill out. It's not like you guys are just going to completely ignore superstars and in, in your approach. Yeah, no, I, the people like want to make a data approach very different, but really like the job is the same. It's just how you get to those decisions is different. You're always... Really, the people who don't use data, they're still using data. They're using their own human experience to that point. Or they're, they're just calling it their intuition or whatever. But it's really just the sum collective of what they've learned to that point. And basically, all we're saying is like use hard data along with that to make better decisions. But the questions are the same. So. What, do, what do you think are the big misconceptions people have? Because now Moneyball and Moriball and this whole kind of sports analytics thing is relatively popular or even cultural. I'm curious for you what... What from the outside looking in do people not really see or get um, when they think, oh, it's yeah? I think the biggest misconception sports. is that everyone's in the back with a spreadsheet, just you know, hitting a number and it spits out what player to get, and then you get them. But it's not how it works. No, huh? it's not how it works. And unless unless we're create, you know, unless you're creating an AI to to play League of Legends, which they're doing right now. Um, you're dealing with people and people are different. Their, their, their motivations, you have to understand, you know, how to, how to get them to their peak performance, how to recruit them. All those things are all critical to the NBA and have little to do with a spreadsheet. Unfortunately, might be better if it was all a spreadsheet, but it's not. So. <laughs> I feel like there's so much that we could actually talk about in the weeds of your your career at the Houston Rockets, but I'm just so tempted to say congratulations on the Russell Westbrook like off season. Yeah, we're excited. He's uh, so we have two recent MVPs. That's happened, I think, only four times in NBA history, uh, where two MVPs are on the same team in the in a three year span. And every time that team's gone on to win the title. So we'll see. We'll see if it works out for us. So you said there were, when you guys talked, there was nothing off, that was off limits that he said. So what he nothing told me. off limits. Yeah. <clears throat> oh. You're not a Russell Westbrook fan. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, I, I just like when I think back to OKC and the fact that James Harden and KD and, and Westbrook were on the same team, I, I, I still can't believe they couldn't figure it out. I mean, they got deep. 
but they, they never did. So at a, won the whole at thing. One of the youngest ages ever, they made the NBA Finals. But I don't think they realized James Harden was as good as he is now, right? That's correct. To be fair, I don't know if anyone did. We 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 put all our assets in to trade for him, um, but no one could anticipate he'd be the best player in the world. Like, why did you, why did you put all your assets? Why him? So both the eye test because he looks amazing. I think anyone watched him, but if you look if you looked at data at the time. Once he had the ball in his hands, and it's still true to this day, and I get a lot of shit because, you know, someone asked me who's a better scorer, him or Michael Jordan, and and it's just factual that James Harden is a better scorer than Michael Jordan. Based now. on the math. Based on literally, like, you give him, you give James Harden the ball, and before you're giving up the ball, how many points do you generate, which is how you should measure offense. Uh, James Harden is by far number one in NBA history, and he was number one even at the Oklahoma City Thunder it just he was coming off the bench. It was a little more hidden. So you needed good data to sort of suss that out. So we knew he had that amazing skill to be a scorer. Yeah, people probably aren't going to like you saying that. I no, no, that people hate it. Now, the know. counter argument is reasonable. They say if you put Michael Jordan on a team now, he would do more than James Harden. That's possible. But if you're just saying like NBA history, how much – if you give this guy the ball, how much does his team score after you give him the ball before the other team gets the ball? It's James Harden. And I know that that makes people mad, it's just, but it's just – it's literally a fact. So, Wow. <sighs> oh, dude, this is awesome. <laughs> now, obviously, there's a lot more parity in the NBA this year with uh, – Yeah, it's great. Players spreading out. Is that something that you guys look into deeply or from like a service level just more excited about – your opportunity in the NBA or getting deeper into the playoffs? No, we, we look at it very closely, but ju- mostly because we're optimizing championship odds. Like, what's our probability of winning the title over a three-year span, roughly? And obviously, as as teams near the top get worse, like Golden State obviously lost some key people through injury and through free agency, uh, that that ups everyone's odds. So it, ri- it, it rises every boat, and you're just trying to gobble up as much of that as possible. And for you, I, I, I always hear about players, they get asked by the media, it's like, did you know this trade was going to happen? Did you know this player was going to send here? Or did you find out about it on Twitter? As a GM, I'm sure you talk to everybody, and you have relationships with every team. That's what my assumption would be. Did you know about all these movements before they happened? Or did you find out the way the public did as well, with like AD going to... Uh, the Lakers or some of these blockbuster trades that happened? Most of the time you have some inside knowledge through their agents or through even your superstars who talk to the other superstar players. And they, uh, in this case, the, 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 the move of Paul George to the Clippers, which then created the opportunity for Kawhi to go there, uh, that, that came out of nowhere, at least for me. Uh, we weren't really in the – we were uh, going after Jimmy Butler – uh, we weren't really going after Kawhi because, for whatever reason, I, he wasn't uh, looking at our organization. So, so it came out of came out of the blue for for me a little bit. So then, were you you just knew right when Paul George went to the Clippers that we were going to go after Russ? So there, it was more like we don't know what they're going to do. So that was just a call the next day, which is like, hey, you guys just made that trade. Are you looking at a different direction? Are you doing something different? Are different people available? Because Russell is obviously someone. Definitely not available and not even worth talking about. Um, and then when we saw there's an opportunity, then it was just how do you make it happen? How often do you interact with the players, like on a day to day basis? A lot. I mean, I'm sure you you deal with this too. Um, yeah, I mean, the player interaction is really important to the job. So, um, you know, just checking in on their life, uh, seeing what they're doing training wise in the off season. Uh, how are they, you know, where they're planning to live, like all, all the all the normal stuff uh, we try to help out with. So then during the season, it's constant because you're in the locker room, you're with the coaching staff, things like that. Do you travel with the team on all the road trips? So early in the season, I'm usually with the team because we're kicking off the season. Once the college basketball season starts, I generally will be out watching future potential NBA players. So Man, interesting. So you actually spend a significant chunk of the year on that side. Yeah, either watching college games or international games, which is where we get it's, players. It's interesting to hear you say like every one out of a thousand players that's like the 56th pick in the NBA draft will make it in the NBA. But Make it hear, significantly, to be fair. You yeah. spend a substantial time amount of time watching college basketball. Does that ever seem or feel like wasted? You know, it does, I mean, college basketball is so much worse than the NBA. It's like, 
it's really, really tough to watch. I mean, it'd be like maybe watching lower levels of of uh, whatever esport you you like to watch. Um, it it can get really hard to watch because they a lot of the players. The problem for us, a lot of the players are in systems that are so dissimilar from what they're going to do in the NBA that it gets a it gets really hard to judge how well they're going to make the transition because the game the game should almost be a different name in college it should be like wow. you know it should be like wow. orange orange hoop ball or something you got to know if they can like play off a pick and roll and all these Yeah other things, like right? well and the spacing's different the zone defense is different the pace of the game is different the level of the players around them is different so i mean that's part of our job is to make that transition but um, the players who go to college, the, their coaches aren't doing them any favors generally. What have your draft picks looked like in the last few years? Because you guys have played so well. I mean, you guys, I mean, I think actually I read a statistic that the, the Rockets have not missed the playoffs since you've taken over as the GM. We have not had a losing season. A losing I season. I think we missed the playoffs once or twice. But That's yeah. still unbelievable. I think yeah. you're only behind the Spurs. Yeah, so the Spurs are the most winning in my tenure, but we're second. Yeah, in the all out of the thirty teams. So, man, I hope the the front office or the owners. They don't have any you. trophy for that though. They need the second best trophy, <laughs> trophy, trophy. Unfortunately, yeah. So, I, with now with what college basketball looks like right now, I think that this is the most excited anybody's been about or been excited about a draft with Zion Williamson obviously going to the Pelicans. Do you have any, uh, just as like a buzzword question, it's like, how do you feel about Zion as a player? Yeah, I mean, he seems like he's a can't-miss guy, it looks like. Yeah, I mean, so I think New Orleans is going to be very happy. On on that note, when it comes to... When it comes to your approach to basketball, I think it's easy to look at baseball and see why analytics works given how many players and how many Mm -hmm. theoretical diamonds in the rough there are, even inconsistencies. Uh, going back to the Westbrook thing for a second, when it comes to the best players in the world, I've I've heard you say certain things about this, but I'm very curious for your, for your perspective. There's criticisms about Russ, for example, on efficiency or his contract, things like that. How do you balance the searching for the best 56th round draft pick and signing Russell Westbrook or signing Harden or someone like that? Yeah, so I, I think I'll come back to your question. But the first one is um, what a lot of – folks miss in analytics or other they they just look at the outcomes they look at like here are the results they've produced in the past and you need to look beyond that you need to look at what are the skills that players ha- that player has that when put we know what that his skills will do when put in Oklahoma City's uh offense and defense the question is not like if you take Russell Westbrook when he's in OKC what will happen when he comes to Houston it's more what are his skills that we can see mm. in Oklahoma City and you put them in our offense and our defense, how will he per- perform in our system? And we generally are looking for guys who are hyper-talented and sometimes, uh, you know, in systems that we think um, aren't aren't ours and can be optimized in our situation. So with Russell, um, he's obviously a hyper-talented guy. You can't average triple doubles and things yeah. like that without being amazingly talented. And we think under Coach D'Antoni and Coach Elston Turner, he'll be even better, essentially. Cool. Well, back to your question, though, yeah, was it? When it comes to you can get a top 10 player or a top yes. 15, top 20 player versus looking for diamonds in the rough. Obviously, yes. the NBA has you have five players on the court, so you have to edge somewhat ah, towards yes, superstars. Yes, yes. How do you balance that? optimization versus superstar i wish it was more common the basketball optimization problem is really straightforward actually uh you need to have multiple top 10 to 20 guys in the league or you can't win the title i mean there's like three exceptions in 60 years something like that so the odds are you got to have two top players those top players you can either do like yeah your diamonds of the rough take multiple hits in the draft and hope to hit someone and the cost of that is lower or you can do or you can trade for one or uh, or you can trade for one or sign one. So uh, we've generally done better with the trade or sign for one than uh, the one where we're trying to take multiple hits in the draft. doesn't make one right or wrong. Ours has a more uh, reliable track record, but we also are in a city that players want to play in, Houston. So if you're in like a smaller market or a less attractive city to free agents, you often have to, you have to go the draft route um uh, instead of the way we've done it how often would there be a time where there's a top 20 player available who you for whatever reason 
wouldn't be interested in? Or is it just a, if they're top 20, you'd you'd take them in almost any case? Yeah, because it's hard to get. There's 30 teams, and so the top 20, if, if, if the math is easy. Like It's hard to even get two, right? Uh, we generally are going to go after any player that we think is an elite talent at that level. And you'll figure out how to And then you figure out how to make it work. Uh, I think a lot of teams make a mistake of waiting for the perfect player hmm. uh, for their system or off the court or whatever it is, and then they're just waiting forever and not successful. So I think for me, to move away a little bit from like players or rosters, I, I think the biggest struggle that I've had in the last two years of working at 100 Thieves is my organizational skills or working with other people that work underneath me in some way. And I have a lot of help um, from my partner, John, who does a lot of the operations and meets with our staff and and, and really handles those relationships. And, and I'm learning so much. And you came into the Rockets and were promoted to the, the GM at, from what I can understand, a young age. What were the things that you did in your career to acclimate yourself to be in that position? Because not only are you managing the team, but you probably have a lot of like direct reports that that people they need guidance or they need help with their own careers. Like, how did you learn so quickly, or how did you get to that position where you could help? I, I was lucky, and then I had worked in many many jobs. You know, starting in telemarketing and working at a movie theater as an usher to to working as a, in a software uh, startup to working in consulting where you do lots of jobs where you're working with lots of different companies to where even I was lucky and I, I would recommend this. I mean, I think it's, it's, you should hesitate to recommend anything because things that work for you aren't necessarily going to work for other people. I always, I always use the example of eyeglasses. Like if someone comes to you and says, oh, I, I'm having trouble seeing like the, the equivalent of that is like, Oh, here's my glasses. Why don't you try them? They work for me. And then when it doesn't work, they say, Oh, it doesn't quite work for me. No, no, no. Try harder. It worked for me. It worked for me. <laughs> so generally advice is sort of cheap and not super useful. But I would say if you can get into consulting, you get like such a fast track of learning how to deal with people because you have to, without power, uh, learn to influence an organization to move in a certain direction. And I think that uh, that training was super helpful to me as I, as I took over in, in Houston. It's so interesting because... I guess it's tougher for me to ask this question since you're not a big fan of advice and you should be hesitant to listen <laughs> to anybody's advice. But, you know, it's, by all accounts, you are a self-made man in sports. You didn't have these relationships. You really created your own path. Is there any advice that you would give? Because there's so many young kids. I feel like traditional sports are not going anywhere. And they, they, there's so much love and appreciation for those industries and, and wanting to work in these, these organizations. Is there any advice that you could give that might put people in the right position or just the right line of thinking that's, that are in college right now or even younger than that? Yeah, I, th I think the best advice I can give, because to your point, I think it's very hard to very hard to do, is is very simple advice, and but it's, it's served lots of people I know well, which is, um, you know, you don't have to know what you're going to do. Like everyone's like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to, you don't have to know, but at any given moment, you should be pointing at some place in the horizon like yeah i'm not sure i want to be a programmer or i'm not sure i want to be a professional uh esports player uh but at the moment at any given moment you should be tackling something like okay i i'm i'm a little doubtful if i'm going to be a pro esports player but i'm going to go for it for this next year right and don't ever do anything without doing it really well and your own and and that has that advice encapsulates a lot because you're only going to do something well if you're actually interested and passionate about it because you should be spending if you're not spending time when you're not quote unquote working if you're not thinking about how to do better on the thing you're working on then you're probably in the wrong field um and and so just whatever you're doing at the time go full force at it uh and and do it well or as well as you can. And then it doesn't matter if you shift later. Just doing something well will get you the right training. It's pretty interesting, too, because you said your son is touring colleges right now, and we won't get too deep into that because it's pretty personal. But is, is that the advice that you're giving to him? Or is there a path that he wants to take and you're enabling it, encouraging it, or you're, you're trying to push him in a different direction? I try be, because, like, if you're not intrinsically motivated, you're going to end up screwed somewhere later in life. By intrinsically, I mean, like, it has to come with within, not just the reward function of the world, money, whatever you want to go after. So I've, I've been very happy. He's, 
he's on things I've never been into. Biology, for example, is one. And he he goes at it full board. So that's the that's the only thing I want him to do. And I Love try that. not to I try not to have either my daughter or my son um, you know, do anything like I did or their mom did, because I think that just creates like a really tough dynamic sometimes. Okay. Mm. Is oh. Oh, go God. ahead. No, no, you go, Jackson. You go. This is your time. You talked about moving in a singular direction, even if you don't really know what it is. I'm curious for you, outside of basketball, are you, is that like where 99% of your mindset is all of the time? Do you have other passion points or interests? And how do you satisfy that curiosity while still being one of the best in the world at what you do? Yeah, so basketball is ninety nine percent, as you say. the 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 one percent that's left, it's, you know, outside of my family, right? Is is I'm really big into Broadway musicals, which is crazy. No but, way. But yeah, I had a musical that came out in Houston last year called Small Ball, which is pretty fun. And then uh, that you worked on or produced? Yeah, so it was an outline of myself, and then I co co wrote it. No way. Uh, um, actually, again, it was 99% the co-writer because you co-wrote it. Wow. No, nah, I, I, I gave like an outline. He, he pretty much wrote it, but it, it, it turned out pretty, pretty fun. Yeah. Do you know Jordan Fisher? I've heard of him. Yeah. He's uh really big into gaming. He actually casted or was a host at the Fortnite world cup and he's uh on Hamilton, isn't he? He was on Hamilton. Jordan Fisher. I gotta get yeah, you should look him up. You should yeah, look him yeah. up. That's super interesting. Yeah. I, I, you also said that you're a fan of like comics. What do you? How do you feel about like modern day like MCU and DC? Yeah. So I don't love the movies. Yeah. I, I know. I know. I know. Sorry. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Just because if you if you're a fan of the, like Amazing Spider-Man comics and the Todd McFarlane run or Uncanny X-Men, like it's 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 definitely so far away from what what what. You know, we read when when I was a kid that it, it gets it gets a little hard. Yeah. How did you feel about the Tobey Maguire Spider Man? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Spider Man to me is actually the recent ones have been pretty good. It's like you're supposed to make fun of the villains. Like there's a there's a whole character to it that I think they're finally getting back to in the movies, which which I which I like. So. So did you even, did you even watch Avengers? I I watch them. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I watch them. <laughs> that, yeah. That's personally. I event. feel I feel like a. Uh, I feel like uh, an idiot for liking them now because know, he no. knows the comics because I enjoy them so much. Like I never read the comics, but I watched like the Spider-Man uh, animated TV show growing up. I mean, I love superhero, just the idea of it. And then I also watch anime. You would love anime. I guarantee it. I, I've. You should I, read the manga. I'm not an I'm not an expert in that, but I I do I enjoy it when I read it. it. <laughs> You'd like Rob Liefeld, who is the creator of Deadpool. He's here in L.A. Really? Uh, he he'd be a good person for your your podcast. Oh, be, yeah. So he cool. he was he was the nade shot of comics. So. No way. Yeah, he was because he he was like at age twenty three on like Levi's ads and stuff like that because he was like that whole generation of comics. Todd McFarlane, Rob Liefeld, Jim Lee, uh, all created the first boom of comics in the nineties, and he was like a he was a big celebrity at the time. I actually got to meet Ryan Reynolds uh, for the original Deadpool like uh, marketing campaign, and it was unbelievable. I was I was I was so nervous because I never had done interviews like that. And the most difficult part about it, which I still get like secondhand embarrassment to this day, is that he stayed in character like during the interview. Oh like, he was Ryan Reynolds and TJ Miller was there, but he was just being like really sarcastic. <laughs> and I, I, I'm convinced that sarcasm sometimes goes over my head. Like it could be the most obvious and apparent <laughs> sarcastic joke and i'll be like why did you say something like that and, like, well, I'm mean. and so i'm having such a hard time because normally if i'm in a one-on-one -on -one conversation i can hold my own and i can i can reciprocate ideas and we can conversate but with ryan reynolds i look like a blabbering idiot this guy looked at me and i think the first thing i told him is like hey i really loved you in blade three <laughs> and he's like what the f did you just say? <laughs> and it was, I'm like, I'm sweating because it's hot in here, but I'm sweating because I was so embarrassed by it. But the Deadpool uh, uh, adaptation, I thought, was actually really good. No, it's amazing. I know Rob was really, really happy. And uh, yeah, he, he first appeared in New, New Mutants 87, Deadpool character. And uh, that's on my wall at home. So. You're an OG. Well, it, it seems like one of the cool things is that you, you touched on it with Spider-Man is that they've clearly started to lean into these are based on comic books. We can have fun with them. It doesn't have to be the Dark Knight. Like it can be fun and 
and alive and all well, Shazam was pretty good too and that was like the first time I've seen like comedy like real comedy in a DC movie but that's I thought that. they did a lot with a terrible character yeah Shazam. yeah but I just think that's a terrible character but I thought they did a nice job I don't yeah. necessarily disagree with you because I knew nothing about that character in general yeah. but I'm not a DC guy I know I'm going to upset the DC guys oh, by the way I don't think New Moons 87 was Cable I think Deadpool is New, Mo- New Moons 89 so Wow, just, just, just had to people, clarify. Well, because the people listening, I'm going to get like yeah, stuff yeah, yeah, on yeah. Twitter. So be, he's an idiot. He well, doesn't even authentic. know my dad. Don't worry, because they're going to be very focused on my like stupid NBA questions, thinking that Steve Young, <laughs> Steve Francis, I'm already going to get chewed up. Okay, okay. Let's get back. I, I was going to say, we, we were deliberate to not spend the whole podcast talking about it. I think we certainly are interested in you are someone from the traditional sports side that has clearly been paying attention to and realizing the opportunity in esports for a long time. Um, I'm curious for you, it sounds like even going back to like 2013 with MLG and I know Nate Silver's been uh, involved in thinking about this as well with the other owners. Where did it come from initially? And, and did you say Nate Silver? Did I? Yeah, I'm sorry. Adam, Adam Silver. Silver. Yeah. Excuse me. Well, uh, there's a Nate Silver too. I didn't want him. 538. Yeah, yeah, that's probably where my brain went. Yeah. Anyway, one, how did you initially get into it? And then two, what are the learnings and kind of where is your head at it now, six years later, after doing some obviously a, a really big move in the space with clutch. Yeah. No, I'm big into sports and I'm big into trends and sort of tracking thing. And even back to 2013, uh, ju- if, and it's even more true today. And I think people are starting to agree and say it. It's like, if you just look at what are the sports to be big later, uh, I like to say the big sports in the fifties and sixties, people don't remember were boxing, horse racing, and baseball. And if you talk to people back then, they'd say, Oh, those are going to be the big sports forever. And, uh, right now, everyone's like, oh, the NFL's going to be this, that, and this is less controversial now. But uh, back then, I was saying it's going to be esports, it's going to be basketball, and it's going to be uh, soccer. And it's because they're the only like sports that are truly global. Uh, none of the other, none of the other sports are played at a high level in every single country of the world. All three of those are, uh, and so I, I felt like that's going to be the driver of of those sports going forward. And and then uh, um, uh, sunshine, uh, sunshine, Sundance, sunshine. Sundance. No, sunshine. No, no, no. Great. No, it's funny, is because oh, yeah, we we our lead sponsor woman in China is Sunshine. So I was like, <laughs> so Sun Sundance brought me in at uh, at MLG. I and, can't wait and, to send him that clip. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna kill. He's probably skiing somewhere and doesn't give a shit. I we actually just saw him, man. He looks great. Does he, he look good? Yeah, yeah he looks good. He, you he's know what? Living off the uh, the Activision. <laughs> The Activision money. Yes. He, yeah. He said he went on a diet. He said he didn't have solid food for oh, 24 yeah. days. And I'm looked at him like, what? <laughs> you got too that, much time on your hands. Yeah. That, well, if your name is Sundance, you have to go on a fast and a oh cleanse for God. sure. He's a funny guy. Between, yeah. How did you meet him? Um, I think basically he invited me to like MLG Charlotte, some horrible location. And so some I, of them were terrible. It's and like, so I went, I went there and I still remember this because, um, um uh why am I drawing a blank? The uh the 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 <laughs> the big esport at the time. Starcraft? The, Starcraft, yeah, exactly. So Starcraft. I was playing Starcraft. I went to the MLG event in in Charlotte and he was like, Yeah, well, there's this thing, League of Legends, that like we just we're just hosting it, but it it's getting all the crowds and everything. I still remember that from 2013. Oh. So um but yeah, that's how I got started. He brought me on the board of ML- MLG, and uh, I didn't know you were on the board. Yeah, I was on. I was on the board until, we should put that until in the, the sale. Intro. Yeah, yeah. Who did that research? They, speaking of people who need to be fired and hired. Whoa, <laughs> Alex, he coming after you? Okay. <laughs> um, there was there's just so many things I could have said. Honestly, the the intro was a little rough, but let's get back to it. Okay, so you're so that's you're on the how board I got MLG. On, on MLG. Yeah, yeah. So. Now. What was the motivation behind the Houston Rockets organization? Were you a big driver? Uh, Myself in the and Ted Brown and the owner at the time, Liz Alexander, all uh, all were seeing this as a trend and saying, "Hey, let's 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 jump onto it. Use our infrastructure and analysis to to help uh, build an esports team." So. That was the start of uh, Clutch Gaming. So. so, so what is the current state of Clutch? Yeah, the, current, the current state, state is like sports? we learned a lot. You know, just like you know, I think if if you start a basketball team, you'd probably make a lot of mistakes. We were just jumping into esports. I'd make and, every mistake. <laughs> well, I think we made every mistake in esports. We had Sebastian, who's, who did a great job for us. 
Um, we we saw League of Legends. I think this is going to turn out to be true. We saw League of Legends as one of the sports that's going to make it to the other end, right? Because otherwise, games come and go, like yep. StarCraft, uh, Call of Duty has had an arc, although it seems to be holding up pretty well. So, but but here's the thing: like very few of these games now are going to still be played in 25 yep. years. We thought League of Legends had a good chance. We didn't know for sure. We think it was a good chance to still be one of the games in 25 years. So we love that as an investment. And then we wanted to build a brand uh, around it. But our, our plan was to first be good at League of Legends, uh, which we were not. I mean, we, we did okay. We like finished fourth or something in the first. I mean, you guys were playing pretty well. We were playing pretty so, well. I mean, it was so difficult to come Coming in. Coming in as a new team too, when you have these legacy teams, it was a huge challenge, I think. It's huge it's challenge. unreal. And then building a new brand is tough. I mean, you've you've done it and done it better than anybody. So I think I it's- I appreciate that. I think Thank it's, you. No, but you guys have a genius, you know, turning into a uh, clothing play as well was very, very smart. And we, we didn't have those ideas. Those are really good ideas. We wanted to first be good at League of Legends and then expand. But what we learned is, like, that's a mistake. Like I don't think necessarily it is a mistake because I, the mindset is always in esports, the fastest track to build a brand or build an audience is to win. But I just think everybody, even like the Golden Guardians or any other team, like underestimated how difficult it would be to step into League of Legends and win right away. Correct. Yeah. Because all these player relationships, it's important. I mean, it was so difficult for us to just convince like Aphromo to leave CLG and join 100 Thieves. He had right. no idea who we were. Right. And so that was one of the challenges. And so I can't imagine as a new team that didn't really have relationships in that sense how big of a hurdle that would be. We had a pretty good pitch and that we know we have a successful model here. We hope we can bring it here, but we didn't have a track record in esports. No one knew who we were. Um, no one really gave a crap about us, which was, and and to build that brand and to be successful is very hard. And esports, using data in esports is by far the hardest sport I've ever seen. I mean, it beats you know any sport you can name, cricket, volleyball, all the major professional sports. Esports are way a whole order of magnitude more complicated and the fact that they change the patches um is you know the fact that the rules of the game are changing every few ga every few weeks is 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 a real limiter to using past data uh so then we try to do things like look for data that would look for players who can be successful across different build types um and that's very difficult to do too so we were at the very early stages with some pretty smart people and mostly fumbling in the dark and failing do you think that will be uh, a large or a, a big hindrance to esports in the future of the the industry? I don't think so. I actually think it's exciting. Like you want to have you want to you don't want to have a sport that's sort of figured out. You want to have a sport that's a bit of a moving target for the fans. It allows like unknowns to emerge every once in a while in esports. You'll have unknown players, unknown orgs like just catch catch a sale and and go to the top. I think that's Very exciting. True. I think that's exciting for the sport. So I think it's actually good for the sport. Uh, it's frustrating for those of us who just want to win consistently because that's what that's what we've been good at at the Rockets, but it's I think it's very hard to win consistently in esports. I think that no one's really come up with that model. A lot of what's happening in esports early is what happens in most sports early is the very, very top talents are usually pretty recognizable, uh, but it, you, the money chases them as well. So generally money will beget winning early in a sports life cycle because you're just chasing the top players with the most money. So that's usually easy to go to. The money ball stuff later where you can win by finding these undervalued players and then constructing a team to do that. That usually happens later in the life cycle. And I don't think it's come to esports yet that I've seen. Are, are you guys still involved at all? Yeah, yeah. So I'm still a part owner of Dignitas. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And and just for the folks who don't know, yeah, we sold the Dignitas because uh, we wanted we figured out like growing our own brand from scratch was going to be probably too big of an undertaking. It made more sense to join a join a bigger brand. So that that was the reason for the for the sale. But yeah, we're still very involved. Prindeville is coming to Houston in a couple of weeks. So. Well, I know Dignitas cool. was a really strong brand in League of Legends. I mean, truthfully, I, I was not a part of the LCS community for a very long time. And jumping in with 100 Thieves was my first involvement in the community. But I do remember that Dignitas was very strong and they were a fan favorite. So hopefully, I mean, for me, I, I want nothing but the best for you or even like Clutch Gaming, just to, to hear somebody of your stature in the world of traditional sports be such a, a big supporter of esports, I think says a lot about who you are and, 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 and what you're passionate about. And 
I think brings a lot of validation to the scene that is absolutely necessary. Um, and I, I really appreciate the time and investment that you've taken um, into into this world because there's just so many passionate young kids and and and, and players and and staff members of these of these organizations and publishers that really really do appreciate it. So I just want to say that. Are you still as optimistic about this whole thing as you were in 2017 when you guys got into this? I'd say more. I mean, I know wow. there's gonna be. You know, I've been through so many booms and busts throughout history in the software world. So I'm. You know, there's going to be like probably a bit of a down cycle, but like the, all the trends are in the right direction. All you have to worry about is the long term trends. People play more and more video games. People use their more and more disposable time on video games. That's going to, and people always want to, are intrigued by elite talents. So that's always going to drive esports going forward. So even though maybe, maybe it's frothy right now and valuations are too high, who knows? We don't know that for sure. So there's probably going to be, if you read like Crossing the Chasm, some of the classic uh, venture capital books, there's going to be a, a bit of a reckoning and a shakeup. Yeah, correct. But then it's, but then it's going to sure. take off again. It's going to be the organizations that come out of that that'll yeah. probably be the amazons and the googles and stuff uh later so on on that note you you brought up soccer basketball esports obviously esports is kind of an index across all these different games from what you've seen thus far can you imagine a world where there'll ever be a game is like a single game as big as soccer or basketball or when you talk about it do you simply yeah absolutely you do uh, I'm, bigger, i mean league I of legends and it can in some ways can rival that and i think it'll be bigger for sure by the time i'm too old to to do any of this stuff, but but you, you just think about it. Like the network effects are so powerful with online games, especially that the you know you just saw it with Fortnite the abil the ability to bring a huge audience all at once for a big a big single event mobilized um, millions is a lot easier than planning a World Cup FIFA event. It just sure. is sure. so. Um, yeah, I, I think there's like no question. These will be the biggest, uh, biggest events in the future. That's it, it. That's for me. I always have the same, when we go and pitch these VCs, I've probably said this before on self-made, but gaming is just so interesting to me because Fortnite seemingly came out of nowhere. Right. I mean, it was just this game that Epic Games like had in their back pocket that like, I'm sure a small team was working on. And then all of a sudden is a global phenomenon. But in my hypothesis, is that's going to continue to happen. I mean, technology is only going to get better. Games are only going to become more immersive and more interesting. And there's always going to be another Minecraft. There's always going to be another Fortnite. And that's and so limiting. It's too. so limiting right. in traditional sports. And now with social media, it's like Fortnite is used as a social platform. It's like one world that all these kids can participate in so many different ways in one place. And that's only going to grow and there's only going to be more opportunities like that. So For that's sure. why I'm just, whenever we start talking about this, my skin starts to crawl. Well, VCs so don't like it generally because of what one thing you said, which is there's no moat, there's no barriers to entry. So like, you know, Fortnite is the the current flavor of the week, but like, can you monetize it enough over time uh, before the next thing comes? And I think that's where VCs come in, but macro level, like uh, that's why we like League of Legends because we think the fact that it survived like almost 10 years now and, and, and survived as a very highly viewed sport and it's, and it's, it's evergreen, like they keep adding heroes and things like that, I think will, and it's got a very strong base in Asia, which I think is its power base. Uh, I think that'll keep it around for the next 20, 30 years. And once you get into like where the dad is playing with your son yeah, yeah. in a game, that's when you have a real yeah, sport. Sure. Most sports take about 30 years to get to that dad playing with his son level uh, of tradition. And once that happens, I think League of Legends will make it forever. Did you see that the LEC uh, grew 38% of viewership this split? I did not see that, no. It's unbelievable. A lot of the, 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 all the metrics are really, really solid right now. Uh, By the way, there's water in that Hydro Flask, fresh okay. water if you wanted it. Just I've give you a heads up. Baking, hey, man, no, I, I already crushed my Red Bull of the day. <laughs> Probably have two more later. Um, so I, I really appreciate your insight on esports. I kind of just want to ask some surface level questions about your role at the Rockets. I know we dove into it a little bit. What would you say is the most difficult part of your job? I would say just managing expectations across every, you know, from whether it's be fans, ownership, players. Uh, it's a constant level of keeping people in the right frame of mind. Uh, working at their highest highest level and highest capacity. So, um, 
Yeah, that's probably my, my the most challenging part of the job. Do you have to deal with any agents that are just terrible? Uh, I'd say most of them. Yeah. Wow. And to be fair to them, the, you know, our our goals are misaligned, right? What they're trying to achieve, which is the most money for their client, uh, and uh, and they have a very short term focus because they might not be with the client uh, in the future. Uh, just does not jive with us, which is we need to fit as many good players into a small CBA collective bargaining agreement box that we can. Uh, so that's where a conflict to start. And then you just add in their personalities are just a lot of them are assholes. So is there anything you're excited about in the next five years that is, that will be different than the NBA as you see it today? Is there anything that you think about with rosters or players that will change drastically? I'm just curious. I'm, I'm sure season to season, you could be so far in the weeds of like players and how the team's performing, but is there anything like bigger picture of the NBA that excites you? Yeah, I'd say the two things, and Commissioner Silver's uh, amazing to go back to Adam Adam there. So I think they're, they're really innovating on rules, both in the G League and WNBA, but I think they're going to come to the NBA, whether it's Hockey substitutions, just one free throw always. Um, just, you know, just a lot of fun, not only dead ball timeouts, so the game flow is there all the time. So there's a lot of, like, fun rule changes that I think are coming. And I love that basketball, like League of Legends, except League of Legends does it every, like, four weeks or whatever, they repatch their game. Basketball is the most changed games of the mm. major professional sports, and I think that's a, a big positive for the game. The other thing for the NBA is just all the the virtual reality and augmented reality stuff that's coming where you're going to be able to be in a simulated courtside seat, which will be really cool. So I think I watched every single playoff game this year, and I watch on YouTube TV, so I always would see that ad about wearing Oculus or whatever uh, – VR, whatever goggle they wanted me to wear, whether it was Samsung or Oculus, right. and they advertised the courtside seats. And I went and I went on Reddit to look it up. I'm like, what was the? What did you guys think? And they said it's not there yet. Not there yet. No. But it will oh be. my god, you know, it, it is be, there. Yeah. It's gonna be because imagine. Yeah. I mean, that Oculus. I, this ain't even sponsored anymore. They they had me review the Oculus Quest, and I had the HTC Vive back in the day, and you had it drill in the sensors into oh, your yeah. wall. Well, and, I did that. And yeah. I had all the cords, plug yep, them in your computer. This Quest is insane. The new HTC is like that too. You yeah. just take it out of the box, put it on. Put it on, It yeah. was so good. I it's, can't imagine. Imagine just like on a road trip and you want to watch the Rockets play the Lakers. Let me just pop this on. I'm courtside. Well, and courtside seats NBA games are the best. The best. It's unreal. Of any. Uh, you've done it. It's no, like, I haven't. You haven't done it yet. Uh, no, it's actually on my Bucket. Wait, have I sat courtside? Well, if you come to, oh, I, no, I sat courtside the Cavs game. I'm an idiot. Dan I Gilbert hooked it up. Okay, I figured you. Yeah, I got the rocket, rocket mortgage, right? So, yeah. Um, but if you come to Houston, I'll get you. I'll get you courtside. So he's like, well, <laughs> how soon? <laughs> Hold on now. Hold on, church. <laughs> but uh, well, what you realize when you're courtside is these these NBA players are just they're like a different species almost like they're so talented yeah. in so many ways so fast so big so strong you don't really see it till your courts you don't walking down the concourse the first time down and and just to see the the court live because basketball was actually always my favorite sport growing up just watching i mean i came in with the late or the, the i was always a chicago bulls fan but i didn't get to really see the jordan era. i got like ben gordon ben wallace kirk heinrich tyson chandler yeah. actually for a little bit Kwame who i know brown, you guys just yeah, yeah. Kwame brown, what's he? not Kwame brown sorry uh, uh tyson uh, chandler yeah. and then oh, curry i know there was a curry there um, but Eddie way, Curry, that's Eddie the, Curry, that's, that's who it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's bad for me. Um, no, that's all right. I mean, that was a long, long time ago, but I just remember walking down into my first game and just seeing the players. You're, you're so right. I mean, it's like, you're in another world. These guys are so athletic, so big, so strong that it's, it's, it's mind boggling when you see it. That's one fun thing about the NBA is they're obviously NBA players. Like my wife even knows it now. If you they just walk in an airport, you see yeah. them. Whereas, you know, esports and even soccer players can look like normal, normal schmoes. So Well, I yeah, I used to live in uh Playa Vista and that's where a lot of that's where the I think the Clippers training facility is, um, where it's right down the street. I used to see Zubak all the time. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, you know, Josh Hart would li lived mm -hmm. around there. And so I would run into these guys at Whole Foods and I'm just like, hey. <laughs> this is so different than Chicago. They're just like casually walking down the street. It was sick. Next one will be sponsored by Whole Foods now. That'd be That's sick good. too. Yeah. Now Whole Foods sponsorship would be great. But they, you know, <laughs> they don't have like uh, all their health food. You know, I can get down with some of it, but I need like, I need bad snacks. Yeah. 
Matt's very, very into non-healthy food. I love well, it. It fuels your play. Man. <laughs> what is uh what is the what is the day to day like right now? What is the off season off season like? Were you at well, the summer just, league at all? So we we announced uh, absolutely at the summer league. So we we had the press conference for Russell last Friday, and yeah, you know, this week is probably the first re- week that it wasn't just one thing after another. The busiest time for us is uh, early June until mid July. So, were there any problems? Wait, did I ask this earlier? What was, what what happened with James Harden, Chris Paul? Do you know nothing, ha- nothing no, actually, happened? No, no. I mean, it was just an opportunity yes. to get Russell. Yeah. So okay, because so. I just kept hearing about them arguing. I mean, we were moments from winning the titles. Are you guys going to win the title this year? Uh, we feel very good about it. Yeah, right. I mean, I'll take that. Yeah. So, Mason, who's hammering? Do they hear it right now? There's someone slamming away here at this sound set. They, uh, <laughs> yeah, they didn't like one of those answers, I guess. Jackson, what else you got, what, man? Because what would you... We got a little you, bit of time. So much of your life has been dedicated to basketball. Mm-hmm. What do you think you'd be doing if if not basketball? Yeah, I, I, would, I think I'd be working in... Uh, in Broadway musicals, that would be what I'd want to do. So, and you've done it a little bit. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So that's my other when other you, path. I, I would imagine for you, you've achieved so much of what you set out to achieve, and and probably what you dreamed about as a kid. I, I imagine there's still that kind of final. Yeah, I need that little final thing. Final cherry on top. Yeah. Beyond that, how do you think about success, or how do you think you'll think about success going forward? Is it going to continue in basketball inherently? Are there other success metrics for you? Is it about legacy? Yeah, no, it's a great question, man. It's deep. <laughs> Jackson coming in with the deep question. I, I would say I, I I try to think about, you know, what are people going to say about you later? You know, so that's probably the biggest thing. Like, what, what are they, what are they going to remember in their interactions with you? So uh, it's generally what I, what I try to think about legacy wise. So if that uh-huh. helps. Yeah. Do you plan to be on, do you plan to be in basketball for the rest of your career? I, I would. This job is so amazing that uh, I'll keep it as long as the, I'm. I think I'm like the fourth longest in the NBA, maybe third longest now. So, as long as they'll keep having me, I'll probably stick with it. I I, I love it. So, are you I'll be around for a while? Are you younger than the average GM even still? I think still, yeah. Although I'm getting, I'm getting to be one of the old. This is gonna happen to you, Matt. To you. <laughs> Look, man. If I end are up you already half- old as an esports owner? Just- uh not as an esports owner. I don't know. <laughs> not as an owner. But- I'm about to turn 27 here in a couple of days. I, and know, I, I know. had like a an existential crisis last night. Like, holy shit, I'm almost <laughs> 30. I used to always make fun of my ex girlfriend because she was uh, one, two years older than me. And she'd always talk about the fact that she's turning 30 and I'd get so annoyed. I'm like, you bring this up every single day. 30 is just a number. Why do you care so much? You're beautiful. You do so great. All these other things. Because she was. But then 30 years old comes around and I'm like three years out from it. I'm like, holy shit. He, he turns 30 and he starts getting into basketball. Though. Like, I actually love that yeah, part of the insane. story, which is just like. Your yeah. life is way cooler than mine. Well, also in just like your career is. I, I love when people kind of reinvent themselves or like you worked in consulting for a while after college and then said, I'm going to, I'm going to make this move. And obviously it's gone really, really well. But I think that that's such a fascinating, or when you talk about musicals too, like when people have these very uncertain or zigzaggy paths, I think it's really, wait, really it's, that's actually really funny because you want to write a musical or you co-wrote in some way or another. I want to write an anime. I feel like that's yeah, like my we'll next thing that I'm going to do. I, yeah, we, how, did, a how did you do it? How did you like get started? Yeah. That? So you, uh, step one is, doing what you're doing which is like you get get someone from anime on your podcast so you want to find the key influencers so one of the key guys on broadway is seth rudetsky is just like this icon on broadway and i you know i reached out to him and ended up meeting with him and, and then it sort of went from there and then as long as you go in with a humble approach you just say look i don't know what i'm doing you know but here's what i've got usually people are willing to help you uh versus like a hey i've got this great idea sort of thing that that's that's not the thing. And I would say, like, in terms of jumping into something new, my my Twitter bio says it. I, I use a phrase from my my favorite musical, Into the Woods, which is opportunity is not a lengthy visitor, which is like these moments are going to come. So the Celtics thing, literally, I was in a meeting after with a two day warning with the owner of it and spent all day and all night studying for it. And I'm sure you've had to go through this as you guys have built this brand um, and had that moment where you know, Wick Grosbeck said, hey, I want to hire that guy. So these moments, you never know when they're going to come. And when they come, they'll just drop everything else and just chase after him, basically. Okay. 
last oh, question. I love that. Last really question. Dope. Last question for me because we've had you here for a while. I I, I think I'm sweating out of it. It's every... like a test almost. Yeah. To see. Yeah. Okay. If esports crashes and burns, mm-hmm. and it, it will thieves... at some point, but but no. <laughs> But go ahead, yeah. Uh-huh. It's definitely uh-huh. going to right? All right, it's it just g- depends on how you define crashes and burns. It's going to have a correction. Yeah, it's going to have a correction. I get yeah. that. We, we, we're planning for it. We talk good, about good, it. Good, good, Crashes and burns, 100 Thieves goes up in flames. I'm out on the streets. I'm on the brink of living under a bridge. Can I come be your intern? Or just give me a job somewhere. I'll sell soft pretzels at the damn You're arena. You're talented for that, but we'll, we'll, we'll find you a job. Don't See? Worry. Look at this. Go. Let's so, go, baby. This has been my you goal. Backstop. You got My backstop. guy. This has been my goal. So I'm <laughs> be our point guard. That's the whole reason he you had you on the podcast. Hey, man, I can play a little defense. You know what I'm saying? Come <laughs> Do you on. ever get to play with the players? Our 2K team we don't have. <laughs> <yet>. <laughs> Wait, no. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Silly question, but do you ever get to play with the players? Uh, in basketball, yeah, no, it would be very embarrassing. It'd be like, it would be like, well, we've seen uh, him play pop shot. I'm just like, oh, oh man, man. Tough, tough. I gotta get you to a real, a real, a real team, but uh, a real, a real pop shot. Hey, this is Dave and Buster's right down the street. I played League of Legends with Aphromoo one time, and it was utterly demoralizing. And I never, uh, did I, I did try to play League of Legends with uh, with the Korean yeah, team yeah. that came over. That, that, that didn't go well. Uh, they, they had me as a quote unquote celebrity, and I was just like spamming <laughs> K L K L Q Q Q K. It doesn't make any sense to me either for what it's worth. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, Mr. Maury, Daryl, sorry. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I mean, this has been me. really, uh, this is for, I think for me, my favorite part is just learning so much about an individual and their career path that I previously didn't know much about. And I think everyone at home appreciates there's going to be some young kids that watch this and I'm sure it's going to be helpful in more ways than one. So is there anything or anybody that you want to shout out? We normally ask that, but... Yeah, Where can people find you? Yeah, do you want people to go follow you? Sure, sure. D Mori uh, on Twitter. Go so, follow D yeah. Mori right now. Go D- do it. D M O R E Y. Yeah. Do you and, mind uh, if I swear? Or Daryl really Mori on Instagram. What's do that? you care if I swear on the podcast? Please swear on the podcast. If you don't go follow Daryl Mori on Twitter and Instagram right now, then f- you. Right on. There and go. Uh, go watch the Rockets win the championship this year. You got a good. That's shot. it. Yeah. All right. How do we get Lonzo Ball on the Rockets? <laughs> I, I definitely can't talk about that. I would violate. Oh wait, yeah, you. Oh yeah, <laughs> shit, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, Lonzo Ball. That is a very Ball. big Lonzo fan. Lonzo Ball at the. We could get his dad on the Rockets. When it's I mean. all said and done, Lonzo Ball will be one of the greatest point guards to ever play the game. You heard it here first. I've got the ZO2s. They're signed. Lonzo, what's up, brother? Come on. <laughs> all right, okay. Um, Daryl, soft chuckle. He's done. Yeah, thank you so much, man. I'm sweating. I'm almost delirious now. Uh, five stars. If you guys wouldn't mind on iTunes, leave a like on YouTube. Um, check it out on Spotify, Google Podcast. Um, and really go send Daryl Mori a tweet for coming on. Because- that was some amazing. You said you were cautious about giving advice, but I think what you said about direction and opportunity was actually incredible advice. So go back, rewatch that a second time too, and just like, drop any gems. Thank if you, you got a good staff, they can like excerpt that and like yeah, we'll pull that one out that and part out exactly. Yeah. Wait, we're absolutely gonna do that. Put it on Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> we're gonna tweet it at you in a week. Perfect. All right, thanks, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, why do the outro? Do an outro. Say something. Go. Put us out. See you guys later. That was weak. That was. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was terrible. <laughs>